Hello and welcome to the Streetcar UK YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe. Today we look at the history and tales of HM Prison Portland. HM Prison Portland is a male adult slash young offenders institution in the village of the Grove on the Isle of Portland in Dorset, England. It is operated by Her Majesty's Prison Service. The prison was originally opened in 1848 as an adult convict establishment, before becoming a store in 1921 and a YOI in 1988. In 2011 it became an adult slash young offenders establishment. Portland Prison opened in 1848 for the holding of adult convicts. The purpose of a prison at Portland was largely to make use of convict labour in the construction of the breakwaters of Portland Harbour and its various defences. The first convicts totalling 64 arrived aboard the HM Steamer Driver on the 21st of November. The Admiralty quarries were developed for convicts to work in and once established convict labour was providing 10,000 tonnes of stone per week for use on the breakwaters. The conditions within both the prison and its quarries throughout the 19th century would later help for calls to penal reform in the UK, as many prisoners died while quarrying stone. From the moment of the prison's inception, the convicts became a tourist attraction. The village of the Grove had been developed directly due to the prison, and a number of homeowners decided to open cafes from the upstairs of their houses for tourists to watch the convicts at work. In 1869, the government announced that the prison, which was originally intended to be temporary, would become a permanent establishment. Although local residents petitioned against this, it did not deter the government's plans. Between 1870 to 1872, convicts constructed the now redundant Grey II listed St. Peter's Church just outside the prison. In 1921, the prison was converted to a borstal. Between 1931 and 35, the Borstal Boys transformed a disused convict quarry into a sports stadium at the back of St. Peter's Church. The first sports day took place on the 1st of August 1936, while the last event spectated by the public was the Foundation Day sports event of 1975. During World War II, an air raid on the 15th of August 1940 saw the Borstal's Rodney House block bombed. This left four boys dead and others severely injured including five being admitted to hospital. In 1983, the Borstal changed to the Youth Custody Centre. In 1988, the prison was re-rolled as a Young Offenders Institution or YOI in Portland, holding up to 519 young males aged 18 to 21. Accommodation at the prison was divided into seven blocks, Benbow, Rayleigh, Drake, Nelson, Grenville, Collingwood and Beaufort. In 2009, the prison was the setting for Ian Wright's Football Behind Bars, a Sky One reality TV series showcasing Wright's work to transform the lives of 24 serious young offenders. It was based on socialising the young men by organising them in a football academy. In April 2011, the prison became an adult slash young offenders establishment. In late 2013, it was announced that it would also be a number of resettlement prisons across the UK. In late 2013, it was announced that it would also be one of a number of resettlement prisons across the UK. This news coincided with the recent decision to turn HM Prison The Verne, another prison on Portland, into an immigration removal centre. In 2010, with the assistance of the prison, a community project was completed to restore the Governor's Community Garden and open it to the public. In March 2000, an inspection report by Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons severely criticised conditions at Portland's Young Offender Institution, including foul-smelling toilets and filthy showers. There were also complaints of rats in food services areas lodged by inmates. Just over a month later, prison officials were forced to extract 26 prisoners who had for 8 hours used furniture to barricade themselves away from their cells. In November 2004, a report from the Chief Inspector of Prisons highlighted racial tension and distrust between Muslim inmates and staff at Portland Prison. The report also criticised the fact that inmates were still slopping out because of poor sanitation facilities at the jail. The report stated that some buildings were unfit for purpose and lacked basic sanitation with the continued practice of inmates without access to the toilet facilities using buckets which they emptied through their windows. The report criticised other elements of the prison, including opportunities provided to prisoners for physical activity and training. In late 2013, it was announced by local news that a museum would be opened to cover the history of HM Prison Portland. The Grove Prison Museum opened in March 2014. Through the work of retired officers John Hutton, Steve Ashford and Chris Hunt, the museum is based in the former Deputy Governor's residence, across the road from the main prison entrance. 
The idea for a museum had dated back over 20 years when it was agreed to store some prison memorabilia items for a possible future museum. These were left untouched for 20 years in storage. A year after the museum's opening, it was announced that over a thousand visitors had been to the museum. And one of the prisons and village's most notable features is a high wall running along the village's main road, Grove Road. This boundary wall remains a significant visual element within the village, and was built in the 19th century to enclose the convict quarry workings. Grove Lime Kiln lies approximately 320 metres northwest of St. Peter's Church. The Grade II listed structure was designated in January 2009. Still owned by the prison service, the Lime Kiln remains a derelict and uncared for state. It was built and once operated by convicts from the prison, and is an important survival and one of the last vestiges of lime production in Portland. Some notable former inmates, Mohammed Amir, Roy Chubby Brown, and Charles Wells. HMP slash YOI Portland is a Category C closed facility. HMP slash YOI Portland is a Category C closed facility holding up to 530 adult and young adult male prisoners. The population profile as a whole was relatively young, with 25% under the age of 21 and nearly 58% between 21 and 39. The vast majority of prisoners were serving more than 12 months, with nearly half serving between 2 and 4 years, and nearly a third serving longer than that. When we last inspected Portland in 2017, we expressed guarded optimism about the prison's future, despite finding some concerning outcomes. At the time, we found outcomes to be insufficiently good across three of our four tests of a healthy prison, and we rated safety as poor. At this inspection, we found that outcomes had not improved in any of our tests, and of greatest concern, the prison remained poor in safety. Prisoners arriving at Portland were received reasonably well into the institution, but induction was often delayed or cancelled. The early experience of many prisoners consisted of extended periods locked in a cell. Levels of violence had reduced following a recent increase in 2018, but remained high and comparable to the levels we saw in our last inspection. Work by the staff to tackle violence, as well as to challenge poor behaviour by prisoners, was not good enough. The situation was not helped by a failure to develop any kind of incentivizing culture that might motivate prisoners to engage and behave. In contrast, the number of adjudications and the use of segregation had decreased since 2017. Indeed, the use of segregation was lower than at similar prisons, and lengths of stay were comparatively brief for most. Living conditions on the unit were better, although the regime was very limited. Some security arrangements were too restrictive, but the prison used intelligence well, and had done some very good work to reduce an influx of illegal drugs. Data from mandatory drug tests suggested a positive rate of just over 5%. Levels of self-harm had doubled since our last inspection, and were now very high. ACCTs of men in crisis was generally poor, and many experienced protracted periods of lockup and isolation. The prison had no safeguarding policy. Our observations suggested a reasonable quality of personnel interaction between staff and prisoners, but the paucity of the regime limited to the ability of staff to engage consistently. But the paucity of the regime limited the ability of staff to engage consistently. Staff were too slow to challenge poor behaviour. It was no surprise that in our survey just 59% of prisoners thought staff treated them with respect. Consultations with prisoners was weak, as was the management of the applications and complaints process. The promotion of equality and diversity was similarly weak, but there was evidence that with the encouragement of the prison group director's office, improvements were beginning to be made. The prison provided reasonable healthcare, but facilities were poor, and prisoners had difficulty accessing the service. The amount of time prisoners spent out of their cells was poor, and reflected a limited and restricted regime, prone to slippage and cancellations, that ultimately undermined so much of the work of the establishment. A quarter of prisoners were not engaged in activity, and could experience as little as one hour 15 minutes out of their cell each day. The curriculum offered in education and vocational training opportunities was appropriate, but there remained too few activity places. Those places that were available were underused, a situation compounded by continued poor punctuality and in some areas poor attendance, although generally attendance had improved since the last inspection. Those that did attend seemed motivated and made the progress expected of them. Teaching, learning and assessment were well planned and there were some improvements in prisoners' achievements. Our colleagues in Ofsted assessed the overall effectiveness of provision as requires improvement. 
The relative remoteness of Portland meant that promoting good family ties remained a challenge. The prison had a good reducing reoffending strategy based on useful needs analysis, and since our last inspection, the prison had reduced its backlog of offender assessments, or OASYs, by half. Too few prisoners said they had a sentence plan, and offending behaviour opportunities and one to one interventions were too limited. Public protection work was, however, good, and resettlement support for the approximately 40 prisoners released each month was reasonable despite most discharged prisoners returning to other parts of the country. Overall, their findings at the inspection were troubling. Outcomes had not declined, and there was no recent evidence that the impetus and initiative provided by the prison group director was having some beneficial effect. This, however, was not enough. They had concerns about whether local managers had realistic grounded plans to meet challenges the prison faced. The prison's approach to safety was lacklustre. Basic standards were not maintained, and staff generally needed to have greater expectations of the prisoners they supervised. The prison also needed to refocus on its primary function, as a training and resettlement prison, and ensure first that it did the basics right. It urgently needed to ensure that an active and purposeful regime was being delivered, and that this met fully the needs of the men held. Nearly two-thirds of the prison's population were under 30 years old. Only 11.5% of prisoners had been at Portland for a year or longer. The level of the prison's self-harm had doubled since the previous inspection, and 16% of the population were sharing cells designed to hold one person. A quarter of prisoners were unemployed during the core day, half the prisoners released were from outside Portland's resettlement catchment area. The public physical health provider is Care UK, and their mental health provider Care UK. Their substance use treatment provider is EDP. The learning and skills provider is Weston College. The community rehabilitation company or CRC, Dorset, Devon and Cornwall, CRC, subcontracted to Catch-22 escort contractor Geo Amy. One baseline CNA is the sum total of all certified accommodation in an establishment except cells in segregation units, healthcare cells or rooms that are not routinely used to accommodate long-stay patients. In-use CNA is baseline CNA less those places not available for immediate use, such as damaged cells affected by building works, cells taken out of use due to staff shortages. Operational capacity is the total number of prisoners that an establishment can hold without serious risk to good order, security, and the proper running of the planned regime. In recent history, a Portland inmate was found with a makeshift weapon and was sentenced. The inmate has been given more prison time after he was found in possession of a makeshift weapon, a vape pen with a screwdriver attached to it during a jail fight. Clive Kashif Smith Khan, aged 23, was serving a sentence at HMP slash YLI Portland on the July the 23rd, 2020, when he was found to be in possession of a bladed or sharply pointed article without authorization. Prosecuting David Ryan told Bournemouth Crown Court that Smith Khan of St George Bristol pleaded guilty to the offence at Weymouth Magistrates Court on September the 2nd of this year. He said the defendant was at a young offender's institution at Portland when an officer saw him in an altercation with another prisoner. The defendant tried to run away, but ran into the arms of another officer. There was a short struggle between them, and the defendant was found to be in possession of a vape pen with a screw attached to it. The officer did sustain a slight injury, but it is understood that it was not a deliberate assault. It was sustained in the toing and froing of trying to restrain the defendant. The court heard that Smith Khan had a number of previous convictions, and that the sentence he was serving at Portland Prison at the time was following a case at Bristol Crown Court on December the 4th, 2018, which involved the charge of being in possession of a blade or knife. Mitigating, Jonathan Underhill said that Smith Khan was at EMP Earlstoke in Wiltshire at the moment on recall, and that he was due for release in December. He said that Mr. Smith Khan told me that he was handed the weapon by another person. Judge Brian Forster QC asked Smith Khan directly how he was doing at HMP Earlstoke. Smith Khan told the judge that he was trying to get parole soon and was keeping his head down. Smith Khan said that since I have been on this sentence, I have been involved in no fights. Judge Forster said the offence is a serious offence. If you have a weapon in your possession, it can lead to a situation where people are injured. You say you were given the weapon shortly before the incident. I do give you full credit for your guilty plea, but your case is aggravated by virtue of previous convictions. I hope things go well for you. Smith Cam was issued a 10 month prison sentence. Another notable story was when a prison officer was arrested after hidden cameras were allegedly found in a female changing room at HMP slash YOI Portland. 
Police launched an investigation after the camera was allegedly discovered in the female staff changing room at HMP slash YY Portland. It was reportedly found at around 1.30pm on Thursday the 29th. A Dorset police spokesman said, It was also reported that at about 7.15pm the same day, a fire was discovered in the changing rooms, which was extinguished by the fire service. A 45-year-old man from Weymouth was arrested on suspicion of voyeurism and arson and has since been released under investigation while inquiries continue. A prison service spokesman said, A prison officer at HMP Portland has been suspended whilst the police investigation is carried out. It would be inappropriate to comment further at the time. Next, an inmate has been sentenced to an extended prison sentence after being found guilty of kicking an officer during a prison brawl. Tyrese Ansel, aged 20, kicked a prison officer in HM Prison Portland on April 23rd after a conflict broke out between inmates and staff. The officer who was restraining a prisoner during an in-yard altercation was kicked in the ribs by Ansel, who was then restrained himself. Prosecutor Elizabeth Valera read a statement from the victim to Weymouth Magistrates Court. It said, It's intimidating and I'm not the person I was prior to the incident. Mitigating Gary Crowther said that it is an enhanced prisoner and an inmate cannot become an enhanced prisoner unless they are doing something right in prison. In a previous hearing, Prosecutor Andrew Newman said that the strike to the ribs caused bruising and the officer had to sign off work for a month. During his return to work, the prison officer was regraded to a different role within the prison because he did not want to put himself in harm's way again. Ansel will now serve an additional 12 weeks in prison consecutive to his current sentence. He will also pay £150 compensation to the prison officer. Tommy Burton threw feces at prison officers. Tommy Burton, 36, pleaded guilty to two counts of administering a poison or noxious thing with intent to injure, aggrieve or annoy and wounding with intent. Burton was standing with a group of fellow inmates when he called the name of a female prison officer. He approached the prison officer and squirted a bottle containing a mixture of feces over her. The substance landed on her face and clothes. The incident is known as potting. He also assaulted a fellow inmate with a knife on Monday, March 13th, 2017 at HMP Channingswood in Devon. Burton was jailed for four years and four months for wounding with intent and a further year for each of the other two counts to run consecutively. He was sentenced to Exeter Crown Court. Inspector Tony Burden of Dorset Police said, We are committed to robustly investigating offences that occur in prisons and work very closely with the prison service to bring offenders to justice. These were particularly horrible incidents and we will not accept prison officers being assaulted in this way. They work in extremely challenging circumstances and I hope this sentence goes to show that we do take such offences very serious. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to let us know what you think in the comments down below. And as always, stay safe.